Hello, and make sure everything's unmuted. Hello, and welcome to Innovation Espresso. Got my espresso today. Brought to you by Arm. My name is Robert Wolf, your host today, and every Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC, here to talk about all the cool things going on in and around Arm. Today, we are joined by Liz Fong Jones, Principal Developer Act. Uh, Principal Developer Advocate at Honeycomb. If you're not familiar with Honeycomb, today you're going to get very familiar with it as we are going to be talking all about Honeycomb, all the cool stuff that they offer, as well as going through some really cool demos. Now, as I usually like to do at the beginning of these episodes, first let me take a little sip here. It's actually a real full coffee. I'm just a giant. Just kidding. It's an old joke. Um, but yeah, anyways, uh, last week we talked with Matthew Krogan. Uh, and he talked to us all about Nix and Nix OS. So if you're not familiar with Nix and Nix OS, you can go watch last week's episode. Wait until after this one, but you can go watch last week's episode. Nix is a package management system, and Nix OS is an operating system that uses that. Now, if you uh, if you did watch last week's episode, um, it was a lot of fun because we got to see the demo. It's a very kind of container esque feel to how you operate and, and manage your packages when you build each uh, individual uh, uh, operating system that you're that you're using. So kind of like they sit independently. Anyways, I'm not going to go into it. It was a lot of fun. Go watch the episode if you have an extra hour in your, of, of, of your day, and uh, you'll have a lot of fun learning about this new developer environment with a really strong and growing developer community. I had a lot of fun learning about it, and it was really cool. So without further ado, I think it's time to bring Liz into the call. And hello, Liz. Hi, how are you? Hello, I'm doing good. Excellent. Yeah, I was, I was telling you in the green room, I've seen you all over the place. I've been following your Twitter for a long time. I've seen you on Twitch. I've seen you on YouTube interviews. I've heard podcasts. You do a bunch of really cool stuff. So welcome to the show. We're super happy to have you here. Thank you. This is super exciting, uh, getting to work with folks uh, from ARM directly, um, rather than interacting with some of the folks that you work with on the Graviton team. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So, um, you know, usually like what we like to do at the beginning of these episodes to get to know our guest, um, kind of like an origin story of sorts. If you wouldn't mind just taking a minute or two, telling us a little bit about yourself, what you do, uh, if, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, so my job title says that I'm a principal developer advocate. And what that means is that I help people better understand the ways that they can run their systems and kind of write software better. Um, but I come from a background of being a site reliability engineer. Uh, basically, I've spent something like 15, 16 years working as one form of systems engineer or another. So figuring out how do we take all of the pieces of all of our modern day systems and how do we assemble them into components that work and make sense and stay reliable. Um, and I originally got into it from uh, essentially doing a, I almost like last night, I think I called it like an apprenticeship almost uh, at a game studio. and that this wild and wacky world of running large scale systems. That is awesome. Yeah. So SRE, uh, you know, new term for me, as I was kind of like doing some research for this episode, it, could you, would you mind telling us a little bit what S so, uh, syst uh, system or site reliability, uh, engineer, what, what does an SRE do? So, Google originally coined the term SRE in around 2003, 2004. Um, I joined Google as an SRE in 2008. So we were about 200 SREs strong at the time. And yeah, basically at Google, the kind of conception of the SRE job role was that it was where you would mix together software engineers and systems engineers from a systems administration background to work together on building and sustaining and running the uh, largest scale systems on the planet. So everything from Google Web Search to Gmail, um, to kind of some of the more modern products we've seen out of Google, like Google Flight Search, um, you know, uh, Google, Google Google Drive, right? Like all these cool products wound up being supported by a team of SREs who would be really responsible for making it scale, making it reliable. Um, and then the world outside of Google started adopting it. And there's have been some really interesting evolutions of how do we make these concepts apply when you're not a company with 100,000 employees, right? How do you make S3 work in a company of 10 or 50 or 100 people? And the answer can't be you have a dedicated team of 12 SREs. That doesn't work if your company is 100 people. Yeah. Um, so kind of how do you make it more consultatory? How do you make it so that you are kind of embedding in teams and being a force multiplier without kind of doing all of the on-call work yourself? 
Yeah, that's that's actually awesome. I mean, I could see I could see the need for uh, site reliability management, site reliability engineering. I mean, across the board, right? And like you said, not everyone has the resources of a Google, right? And so, uh, you know, I think this is where Honeycomb is going to come in, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely for sure. Right? Like, I think Honeycomb, where I work right now, is a company that is focused on making software developers' lives better by making it easier to debug software in production whether you're an SRE or not. Uh, many of our customers are SREs themselves, but a lot of them are software developers who just want to own their own software in production rather than have to like, you know, get someone else to coach them on it, right? Like they should be able to just own and operate it uh, themselves. That's awesome, that's awesome. And we're gonna dive a lot more into Honeycomb in a moment, but I wanna kind of continue on this origin story because I was doing some research on you along with following you for quite a while now. And you do some really interesting things. Uh, number one, let's talk about your Twitch stream, if you don't mind. Um, in December, you did a 25 days of code, which I thought was awesome. You had you had quite the viewership there, sitting there watching you plug away at your code. Uh, maybe you could talk to us a yeah, little bit Yeah, anywhere between you know, 10 people or 50 people or 100 people. Um, there's kind of this really interesting and cool community around this, uh, this coding challenge that's called Advent of Code, uh, adventofcode.com. And one of the really cool things is that basically the problems are posed like, you know, in, in kind of free text form, you have to figure out what the puzzle author Eric Wastel intended and then write up code in any language of your choice to parse the input and, and perform the operations that it asks for. Um, so yeah, there's this really cool community of folks who stream on Twitch um, who all compete in this. And uh, it's not really competition in the sense that we all, you know, if you finish before someone else, you send your viewers on to that to that next person mm, that, like that you want, want them to cheer on, right? Like, so it's very much this collaborative thing rather than this, like, you know, hyper competitive, I'm out to get you thing, right? Like, instead, it's like, you know, no, we're, we're here to kind of spread knowledge about how to become a better uh, software engineer. And some people open chocolates for their advent calendar. <laughs> And other yeah. people open up Eric Wastel's excellent uh, puzzles every day at midnight uh, Eastern time. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. That's really cool. Now, one other thing that I, I noticed that I thought was just really cool because I am a gamer. I've been a gamer my whole life. Um, I've tried playing EVE online. I noticed you have an EVE online alliance. EVE is probably one of the most um, intricate games I've ever opened up on my computer. Um Tell, tell me a little bit about EVE and, and so, your alliance. Yeah, for here. people who don't know what EVE Online is, it is essentially a, um, I, I, I jokingly call it a libertarianism simulator in space. What would happen if society were fully libertarian where, you know, kind of there's this idea that might makes right and that, you know, you can do whatever you like. And that includes, you know, anything from providing support to each other, providing insurance to, to each other to kind of taking over each other's uh, stuff if you think that that you're stronger than them. Um, and, and there's no government out there to save you, right? Like, so I think that's particular, uh, you know, it's it's fun to do like online where you can walk away from it, where it's just like, uh, where, it's, where it's just, you know, internet pixel spaceships that you can walk away from if you lose. That's not the case in real life. I think that libertarianism in real life is potentially a bad idea, but I think it's really interesting to get to play around with and explore some of these ideas in a in a in a setting that's that's made up, that's fictional. And as a YouTube commenter notes, it's it's like spreadsheets in space. Um, there's a lot of automation that happens behind the scenes. Um, Eve Online corporations have more sophisticated HR software than many mid-sized corporations. Wow! Like an Eve Alliance. Um, my alliance at its peak was about 400, 500 people. Um, our coalition was about 10, 15,000 people. And at one point I was in charge of the entire thing. Um, Whoa. I, I was elected as the kind of head of, head of the council of the security council. That is really cool. Yeah. I remember one of my buddies uh, plays, plays Eve. And one time, I guess he worked really hard to get this really cool spaceship and then he got killed. Yeah, <laughs> and he lost it. He lost it all. Everything yeah. he had. On don't the don't fly while you can't afford to lose, right? <laughs> and knocking it is or building it is consent to potentially losing it. Yeah, no, that's it's crazy. It's a very unforgiving, but I'm sure rewarding uh, game. So uh, yeah, nice. I you know I wish that it ran on I wish that it ran on ARM on Linux, but even the uh, Linux x86 support is uh, not officially supported. 
Uh, yeah. it, it does run on Mac's of all varieties, though, so at least there's that. So I don't think there's any engine limitations to it. It's just a matter of like demand to build to build it for to run on, on that specific hardware combination. And it's it's huge. It's a huge game too. So yeah. Nice. All right. So um, that was very nice to get to know you, Liz. Thank you so much for that that great intro. Uh, and now I think it's time for the icebreaker round, which we call Innovation Coffee Cribs. So let's cue that. All right. So unfortunately, at this moment, Liz is unable to access her workshop desk. However, she was so nice to provide us with a shared folder of cool photos that she's going to walk us through right now. And I'm going to pull these up, Liz. And if you wouldn't mind, so this is this is the stuff that's kind of on your, your work workshop or demoing desk? Yeah, that's exactly correct. Um, so this is one of the first photos that I took when I set up for the first time uh, my own personal ARM workstation. Um, so this is the device that I use for doing work. Um, so it is a 16-core uh, ARM Cortex-32, uh, ARM Cortex A72. Um, and it is capable of doing all the things that you would expect. Uh, it runs Ubuntu 2004, um, it runs Chromium, it basically, I can download and build Honeycomb source code, the other Honeycomb, my employer. So funny story, Honeycomb LX2K is a product of Solid Run. Honeycomb.io is my employer. They have no direct connection to each other. I just happen to like both. And think and, that the coincidence is very nice. And there was it was all coincidence, no collaboration in, in the effort at all. At all. No, it was just completely by accident. I just saw the board and was like, I, I, I want this. Um, Very cool. So yeah, this is what it looks like um, with the backplate taken off. Um, so you can see that, you know, I have like a mouse plugged in. I have a, uh, a, a 10G, 10G network, uh, network plugged, plugged in. Um, and it is actually very, very power efficient. Um, you'll see that there is a like power cable stretching in there, and that is a uh, a twelve volt DC a twelve volt DC power cable. Um, so wow. it draws about one hundred and twenty five hundred and forty watts uh, in total for the whole machine, including the graphics card. The actual uh, Cortex A seventy two uh, is thirty five watt uh, TDP, which is pretty much unheard of for a sixteen core machine, which I think is pretty neat. That is awesome, and it all fits in a bag. It all, all of my computers together fit inside of a bag. <laughs> you can see all three devices that I use day to day uh, in that suitcase. Um, so uh, bottom right is the R, is the ARM Cortex device uh, by SolidRun. Uh, lower left uh, is the machine that I'm talking to you on from right now. Uh, that is my kind of uh, streaming uh, streaming setup workstation. And top is my gaming rig. Um, so. All of these things fit in a suitcase, and you just pad it with clothes, and you and you put it in the luggage, and it and it comes out the other end, and you just set it up and go. I need to figure out how to make my setup as compact as this because this is pretty awesome. I mean, sometimes you go visit a friend that's also a gamer, and you want to just pop your computer. Yeah, out you just there. pop your computer in. You just plug in <laughs> monitors. So actually, so I split my time between Sydney, uh, New South Wales, and Australia, and Vancouver, BC, and Canada. And I just throw that, um, I can't bring all of my computers with me when I do this, but I, I, th I throw my gaming rig uh, in my carry-on suitcase uh, along with a pile of clothes and that, and I just plug into monitors at the other end. Uh, that's wow. how, I, how I move between households. That's really cool. And this right here is? That's the uh, official oh, same one. backplate. Yeah, yeah okay. that's the official nice, backplate yeah. to the Honeycomb ITX. Um, so they actually did a run where they produced, uh, where they produced a run of backplates for it. So it looks a little more professional. Very cool. And then uh, you can see over here that actually um, what I, I'm speaking to you from hardwired fiber. Um, so that that is the uh, a external uh, 10, 10 gig network card um, by Edge Optics. Um, and that is, yep, it's running at 10, at 10 gig. And that, and it's being powered off of this tiny, tiny mini ITX workstation with fiber connected directly to, next slide. So wait, so you're actually getting 10 gigabits right now? Uh, not to the internet, but uh, that is one gigabit to oh, one gotcha. one point two five okay. gigabit to the internet. Um, so that's the uh, SFP adapters um, between the uh, between the upstream provider and and Ethernet, uh, nice. and then the Ethernet runs to my uh, runs to my ten gig switch. Um, so yeah, nice. that's that's basically a quick tour of my home networking setup. And yeah, you can see that, you know, um, the other cool thing about the Honeycomb ITX board is the firmware is UEFI Tiano Core uh, EDK2, which means you can build it yourself. You can tweak it yourself, um, fully open source, uh, fully buildable. And 
and you know, it's, it's a BIOS. It does what you expect, um, except for it's actually under your control, which I think is pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Very nice. Yeah. Um, and, and for anyone, you know, who wants to dive a little deeper into the honeycomb board, uh, we actually did a series of videos with John Nettleton from Solid Run, um, and we'll pu we'll put those uh, the links to those videos in the, in the description when this when this gets published. Um, so a lot a lot of cool stuff happening uh, in in this area, and and I'm I'm actually stoked that you're using the honeycomb. So I think that's cool. Yeah, um, I it, use it in anger. Like it's re it's a really great machine. Um, nice. It originally, up, you know, full disclaimer, I got it in April or May of 2020. And it's really, really, really matured in the past two years. I, I've got to say, like originally, you had to install a custom kernel to make the uh, the PCIe graphics card work. You had to install a bunch of custom stuff to make the networking work. And now it just works out of the box with the um, latest hardware support, uh, twenty oh four kernel uh, kernel on Ubuntu. So very nice, very nice. Yeah, uh, hi hybrid robotics. Uh, there, there's the link to the, the breakdown, but we'll make sure that's in the in the uh, in the description as well. Uh, hybrid robotics. Uh, one of our uh, esteemed community members. I think he's been attending ten episodes in a row now. Uh, ooh, I want that. <laughs> uh, so that's cool. Um, all right. So I think now it's time, Liz. Let's dive into Honeycomb. Uh, let's do a deeper dive into Honeycomb. You kind of at the beginning talked a little bit about it, but let's give that overview one more time, bird's eye view. What is Honeycomb? Yes, so Honeycomb is a data analytics uh, company that helps you understand the behavior of your software running in production, regardless of what language you're using, regardless of what hardware architecture you're using. Um, we're here to help you understand your microservices. Um, so the way that that works is you install our SDK into your application and for every request that your application gets, it'll emit a chunk of telemetry data to Honeycomb. And then we will store it and analyze it for you so that you can understand why is my site slow? For who is it slow? How do I make it faster? Um, we can kind of help you with all of that. And kind of all this falls generally in the umbrella of APM or distributed tracing. Uh, this idea that you can analyze the performance of your applications, of uh, what your application is doing in real time to get visibility into what's actually happening under the hood. And so just to make sure that we're covering all the terminology here for people who don't know what telemetry data is, that's the output data um, of status data, right? Of your, of your application. Exactly. Like some common kinds of telemetry data you may already be familiar with are things like metrics or things like logs. Um, but in our view, the best form of telemetry data is kind of well-structured logs, so well-structured that they become essentially trace bands because they're interrelated. So you can see what line came from what request and who called that, what other request made that happen, right? Like, so you can kind of generate these beautiful waterfall graphs that tell you kind of the causality of your system. Very nice. And I understand that in a, in a little bit, we might get to see the Honeycomb UI in action. Yeah, I could totally show you the Honeycomb UI, but you know, let's do that with a little bit of context because yeah. I think the best context is first to illuminate a use case Yes, and then I love that. show you how you know we dog food using honeycomb to absorb honeycomb, and that'll give you, I think, a, a better picture. Cool. So, what what are what are some common use cases for honeycomb? And if if anything, maybe you could also share like uh, actually, yeah, let's just start with use cases. What what are some common use cases or the most common use case that you could think of? Um, so we're used by companies ranging everywhere from you know from startups that are very very tech forward, you know, that are trying to move very very fast that have like you know ten to twenty employees all the way up to large enterprises like Vanguard, right? Like tech forward, large enterprises that want to modernize the way that they ship software um, to kind of start do, adopting microservice delivery, to start having smaller teams ship smaller services more often. So they don't ship, you know, once a month or once a quarter, they're shipping code every day and they need to see, see what's going on with that. Um, so we're there to support them in that journey. So they embed our SDK into their code and then start sending the telemetry data. And then it's up to us to make the analysis fast and performant. That's very nice. Yeah. So um, now that we know the use case, uh, let's dive into telemetry and the overview of the Honeycomb UI. And I would like to really quickly, um, you know, before we dive into looking at the UI, I did see this really nice diagram. And I'm going to pull this up because maybe you can shine some light on this here, let me share the window. Da, 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 da. So you have kind of a nice diagram here of the old way and the honeycomb way. 
So yes. maybe you can kind of walk us through this a little bit. I'm going to make it a little bigger. So you can kind of like outline what, because we're going to see the UI. So you can kind of outline this to us, how the old way works and how Honeycomb has changed the game. Yeah. So in the old way, there was this idea that, that, you know, monitoring consisted of accumulating as many different signals as you can, and then try to correlate it together on the back end. Um, so you would have your metrics, you know, the number of requests that, that succeeded and failed. You would have log lines coming of your application from, you know, all over your code. And then you might have added a distributed tracing library and kind of that you'd be squinting at these three different things, trying to piece them all together. And sometimes they come into conflict. So our concept is slightly different because we are one tool that enables all three of these use cases from the same population of data. So when you send sampled traces to Honeycomb, we're able to reconstruct a trace waterfall view, or we're able to reconstruct the raw individual log lines, or we're able to reconstruct you know, the number of requests that succeeded or failed, that all three of these cases can be derived from the same data, and we can get a lot smarter about it Instead of wondering, like, you know, hey, if these two lines on the metrics wiggle at the same time, does that mean that those, you know, that one caused the other? We can more definitively answer that because we have the raw data that says, you know, that in fact, yes, those two, uh, those two phenomena are coming from the same set of requests, or those two set of phenomena are not coming from the same set of requests. They're two N, N related things. Very nice. Okay, cool. So we're going to get to see this. Do we want to do this now or do we save it for, for later? Yeah, I can show you now. Um, okay, excellent. So over here, um, this is the Honeycomb UI. So you can see the number of requests that are coming into the Honeycomb web UI. So there is obviously, you know, this is Honeycomb's dog food instance. There is also a copy of Honeycomb uh, that people, you know, that people use uh, day to day day to day, but we have a copy of Honeycomb that's observing this. So when I issue a page load here, that winds up being reflected over here. So I can just go ahead and drill into that and I can see, you know, what's the population of requests and I can even do filters like uh, app user email is lizf at honeycomb.io. Right, and now I can see just my requests. And those are relatively fast, but I can even, you know, go and uh, let's look at the past 10 minutes. That's going to be more informative. This one took 150 milliseconds. Let's figure out why. Or uh, while that's loading, right, like I can also go back here and I can say, okay, um, you know, break that down by the, uh, by the request path, right? And I can see all of these, uh, all of these URLs. Um, so it's kind of this ability to slice and dice on the fly and kind of, issue any query that I might need in order to debug a problem. Oh, interesting. So I was reporting back a bunch of content security policy violations. That's fascinating. Our front end team is going to have to look at that, right? Yeah. Um, so you can see here, right? Like this is the causality related view, right? You can see why did it take 150 milliseconds? Well, we did one database call that was blocking for six milliseconds. Then we talked to launch sharply, which is very, very fast. And then finally, this had to talk to our uh, our query backend, and that took 110 milliseconds, and that's the majority of the time, right? So being able to flip from kind of this metrics view to a individual trace view, or to flip directly to let's go ahead and examine this as just raw individual rows. And so this can this can this changes the game big time. I mean, this helps. This helps developers find areas to optimize, right? I mean, essentially, you can optimize these particular areas to reduce. Right, exactly. Right, like so, I might know then that I need to dive into the performance of the query backend, or I might need to dive into, you know, uh, if the database were slow, I might want to dive into why. Um, awesome, that's really cool. All right, so um, now I guess you know I think this one right here is the most important part of this segment to me, right? I mean, ARM developer, we're going to talk about Honeycomb on the AWS Graviton. And this is where I kind of started following you, I think, when you started talking about all of the migration efforts for Honeycomb to Graviton. Nice shirt, by the way. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, love the, it. Yeah, uh, folks at AWS <laughs> sent it over to me um, oh, because that... I spent so much time advocating for Graviton. Well, can I send you one of these shirts and one of these hats then? I mean, Absolutely. That's totally fair. I okay. love to wear an ARM developer shirt. Hat we'll talk, maybe not so much, but we'll figure that out. We'll talk, we'll talk after the show. So so let's let's talk a little bit about the, the history of this migration and why you went to I mean, because from what I understand, 95% or a large amount of Honeycomb's workloads run on AWS Graviton now. 
So these are all arm based instances. Let's talk about the history. What, what made you even decide to do this from, from the get go? Where did you say, Oh yeah. Hey, this arm graviton thing looks interesting. I want, I want to give that a shot. Yeah. It was two different factors. Um, so as a data, as a big data analytics company, um, a majority of our cost of goods sold comes from the cost of the compute that we do on behalf of our customers. Um, so we realized that any optimizations that we can make that decrease cost and decrease the amount of time that customers spend waiting for their queries to come back translates into happier users and improved sustainability of the company, both financially as well as being greener on the, on, on the world. Um, so when AWS announced uh, the Graviton2 processor in December 2019 at reInvent then, um, we were very, very keenly interested in understanding what might it take for us to adopt? Like, can we try this out? Um, so in February of 2020, we were invited to trial Graviton2 uh, under, an, under a conference on DA with AWS. And they basically said like, hey, like here's access to some M6G instances, like, you know, play around, tell us what you think. And this turned out to be a reasonably good fit for us because we were, you know, primarily at the time bare metal, uh, not bare metal, but like bare, bare instance AWS um, EC2. So not, not using any container technology. Um, so we decided that we were going to try to flip over one of our workloads first to try to compare uh, between ARM64 and AMD64. And we were using the Go language, uh, which supports cross compilation out of the box. You just uh, set the environment variable Go arc, and it will just build a binary for the appropriate architecture. Um, so that made it surprisingly easy to produce binaries for ARM64 from our source code. Um, so that that took you know thirty minutes to do in our in our CI system. But the real challenge was that the bootstrapping process, right? Like because we use bare EC2 instances, we had to do a fair bit of work to make sure that all of our system level dependencies for our AMIs uh, would, would run successfully in ARM. So that took a little bit longer. That took about a week, but like still it wasn't onerous. It was just a little bit of upfront work. But, you know, this was worth it because this is worth trying because we'd seen AWS claim, you know, hey, like you can run 20% fewer of these, right? The performance is 20% better and it's 20% cheaper. So we're like, yes, if you can cut, you know, 40% off of our compute bill, we're, we're all, we're interested. Um, so, you know, within two, two, three weeks, we had, um, we had had copies of our binaries running on M6G instances for comparison with our C5 instances that we were running before. Um, and the results were quite good. Um, basically, we were able to validate AWS's claim that yes, the performance is 20% better. You can run 20% fewer instances. Oh, and by the way, also the tail latency is much better that you'll have many fewer users at the tails, you know, the worst 1% of performance actually got about, you know, 50% better. Awesome. So that was really, really cool. But we had to be careful about kind of which parts of our architecture we moved first, right? Like if you're not sure about the stability of something, better not move your kind of core storage because that if you corrupt something, right? Like or if there's a bug, you, you really don't want to drop the data. So what we chose to do for this experiment that made both AV testing easier, as well as the kind of rollback plans if it didn't work out, was we used our ingest workers that are completely stateless, that basically, you know, are a traditional web service, right? Like where they receive requests and then they route them to a backend. And you can do rolling restarts of them. You can, you know, send 5% of your traffic to them, right? Like it's, so that was kind of our game plan for getting started from the, from the beginning. That that is a that is a great story. I mean, like you took it all the way back to 2019. So very cool. Um, and uh, I mean, it's exciting to hear. You know, uh, this is this is a uh, a real use case. This is a a, a real uh, let's call it success story, right? Where you as Honeycomb were using something uh, that wasn't uh, ARM based, and then you switch over to the AWS Graviton twos, and then you were able to literally kind of justify or prove that all of the statements that were being made were true and you proved it on your own workloads. Right, with our own workload. Really cool. Because right, yeah. as AWS loves to say, benchmarks are benchmarks, but like the real asset task is what real customers are able to achieve. Um, yeah. So we moved our ingest workers um, and then we moved some of our uh, customer and storage nodes. Um, and then we tried to move some of our Kafka routing um, and that did not work for a variety of different reasons. Um, so we had to roll it back. 
But the good, happier news is that in November of 2021, we were able to roll that forward um, once AWS introduced kind of the right shape of instance that was better suited for our workload uh, and also is Graviton too. Nice. Very cool. All right. So um, I guess, I mean, you kind of talked about this a bit, but let's let's just ask the question again so we can focus on it. Like if for, for all the AWS users out there, Honeycomb has multiple solutions, offerings, products, if you want to call them. Um, I mean, I can look here at the site. You have uh, solutions for AWS, solutions for gaming, open telemetry, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But yeah. let's look at solutions for AWS. What is the uh, Honeycomb AWS solution? Offering? Yeah, so right, like I think we separate it into both kind of Honeycomb the data analytics platform, which is the same for everyone, and then kind of what APIs and SDKs you use to interact with the Honeycomb platform and send data to us. Um, so in our view, it's best if you add Honeycomb uh, to your SDKs, right, or add Open Telemetry to your SDKs and configure it to route data to Honeycomb. But there are a number of places that don't yet fully support open telemetry. Um, so for instance, uh, if you have Amazon ALB logs, right? Like we want to be able to ingest your ALB logs uh, so you can keep track not just of what happens inside of your application, but what happens upstream of your application before the data gets routed there. Um, so therefore we have built binaries that will basically scrape your ALB logs and forward them onto Honeycomb. And, you know, these are you know, various different binaries that we built that, you know, we ourselves run on Graviton because it turns out to be more efficient. Um, so they're all built for uh, built for Linux ARM64. Um, so basically every single one of these, uh, every single one of these integrations is built both to uh, be compatible with ARM and, and AMD. Um, and there are various mechanisms for extracting data out of your AWS environment if you can't necessarily uh, get that data from your application itself. And one integration I want to highlight in particular is that upper right one, the AWS Lambda integration. Um, so we've built a AWS Lambda layer that will forward structured logs that your application on Lambda generates to Honeycomb and does not block the response to your customer, right? So you can return a response to your customer in 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. If it takes an additional five or 10 milliseconds to finish flushing the data honeycomb, right? Like the Lambda layer architecture enables us to kind of take care of that once your application code has finished running uh, without you having to worry about it. Very nice. So, so Liz, um, you know, when you, I want to, I want to actually, sorry, I want to interrupt here a little bit because I have a kind of a comment slash question here. Maybe you can offer some help to this person. Um, so Jonathan says, I've just started instrumenting my Rust code with tracing recently. I'm exploring uploading open telemetry traces to query, but choosing the right trace database is tricky. Maybe you can offer some insight here. Yeah. So in terms of tracing backends, um, you know, you fundamentally have to make the choice of, am I using a open source backend like Grafana Tempo or Jaeger, or am I, you know, interested in using a closed source proprietary solution like Honeycomb as the backend, um, right? Some people do prefer to, you know, build it themselves, run it themselves, but I think there are a lot of perils there. The, you know, the free price tag, it's not actually free. It costs you machines to run. It costs you your developer time. Um, but the beauty of open telemetry is that you don't have to lock yourself in to either open source or closed source backends or any, even any particular closed source backend, right? You can try sending data both to Honeycomb as well as for instance, to one of our competitors, Lightstep. Um, you can send to both at the same time and see what you, you know, do and don't like. And if the initial volume is pretty small, like you can fit in the free tier of all of these solutions, right? So you can compare for free, Honeycomb free tier, Lightstep free tier and Jaeger and, and Grafana Tempo and kind of see what you like best. But I think the, you know, going back to the trace waterfall view that I showed earlier, right? Like trace waterfalls, anyone can do, right? Like that, that's, that's kind of tail safe. I think the more interesting capability is how does it work when you are filtering through millions of different traces, trying to look for the behavior that you want? Can you visualize more than one trace together? Can you see what's the P99 latency of the requests from Canada using the Canadian French language pack using this particular build of your application. And can you compare that to what, what was going on a week ago, right? Jaeger cannot do that, right? I, I think at that point, you're basically looking at a closed source solution because of the kind of investment that we've made as these you know, big data analytics companies that work on improving software observability. 
that observability is really something that requires dedicated focus uh, from a team that's dedicated to working on it. Yeah, you, you close source solution or, you know, take a couple of years and build it yourself. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, cool. Wait, you know, what's interesting about that, though, is like I actually uh, we'll plug this at the end. But I have a book coming out in which I actually wrote a chapter. Uh, one chapter is dedicated to what does it take to build a back end data store like Honeycomb's? Uh, we kind of okay. expose all of our secrets there and talk about like all the challenges. So, you know, at least there is a blueprint for you if you'd like to spend the, you know, three years building the solution. Um, but in our opinion, like you probably are better off just, just using something that's already available off the shelf um, yes. where we've tuned it and optimized it in with the help of, of the Graviton team, right? Like to make this super fast, super economical. That is, that is awesome to hear. That's, that's really great. And Jonathan, I hope, I hope that, uh, you know, what Liz just shared right now helped you out a little bit there. Um, and I think that is kind of the perfect segue into this next topic, which is open telemetry. So open telemetry, I mean, you, we've kind of touched on it already, but let's just start at the top. What is Open Telemetry? Open Telemetry is a uh, project hosted by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation that is a collaboration between all of the varying uh, end users of telemetry, and as well as the vendors and open source solutions that provide telemetry backends. Um, so we're designed to be agnostic about where you send the data and to allow you to kind of collect that data using a common set of APIs and route it anywhere that you need to route it. Um, so we support basically every language out there uh, that's commonly in use. Uh, our more popular ones are definitely, you know, Java, Go, Python, uh, JavaScript, Ruby, uh, among others. But like, basically the idea is that by providing this common standard for how to do tracing and how to do metrics collection and soon how to do logs collection, that we enable you to not have to be locked into any particular vendor or, or open source solution. Um, so it, it originally, you know, a lot of the foundational work for open telemetry started in 2016, 2017 with open census and open tracing, which were two competing open source solutions at the time for doing this. And then they kind of reconciled some of their technical differences and we all came together under the open telemetry umbrella to develop kind of one standard uh, for, for doing this rather than having two competing standards. Very nice. And so you say this is hosted by CNCF, Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, Sandbox, officially graduated project. Uh, we are now officially uh, a incubated project. Um, incubated. Awesome. So we moved, we moved from uh, Sandbox to incubation uh, early this year, end of last year. Yeah, for, for those of you who aren't familiar with kind of like this process that CNCF has, you can go visit their website. We'll, we'll share that again also in the description. But they have a lot of really cool projects they host, and this is kind of how the community is enabled uh, to develop on these. Now, right. And I think it's really, really helpful for us as vendors to kind of have this forum to interact with each other that, you know, doesn't privilege any one vendor, doesn't feel like... One of the challenges I think with Open Census was that it was hosted by Google, right? And Google was kind of the elephant in the room that was kind of driving the project. And like, yes, right, like Golang demonstrates that you can have a very successful kind of single vendor driven project. But that's not what we wanted to do here. We wanted to have something that was going to truly be vendor neutral, where anyone, including end users, including vendors, could contribute on a equal uh, footing. Yes, yes. Very nice. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, what is it? Um, I, I want to say like it, open source. I, I always kind of like, and I've mentioned this before on the show, but like you always want to try to find that win, win, win model, right? Where like everyone has an opportunity to win in this, in this game, right? Yeah. And by and large, right? Like I think all but one vendor have been really, really on board with this because we recognize that it doesn't make sense to develop our own proprietary SDKs. It's just so much work duplication, right? Why should there be 15 different implementations of automatic instrumentation from the, uh, you know, from the Node.js Express framework. That just doesn't make sense, right? Like, why not have one implementation of that that all of us contribute to? Yes, yes. Awesome. All right. So um, let's move on to the benefits of being open source. So, I mean, like, you know, I just said, okay, well, we always want to try to find this win-win-win model. But, like, what are some of the benefits that you've seen for open telemetry being in the open source space? for developers, for users, for vendors? I think the primary one is that because it is a vendor neutral open source standard, library authors are starting to build open telemetry into their libraries directly. So you don't have to do any kind of monkey patching that a library author feels sufficiently confident in our technical vision, in our kind of staying power that they're willing to add open telemetry's APIs as a dependency. Um, 
which means that the instant that you as a software developer instantiate the open telemetry SDKs, you will automatically get telemetry data flowing from the libraries that you use. Um, so I think that's kind of the main thing where no people didn't want to commit to, you know, Honeycomb has had its previous generation of SDKs called the Honeycomb Beeline. And it would be ludicrous to ask, you know, an open source developer to, you know, bake in the Honeycomb Beeline by default, right? Like people would be like, but, you know, what if someone isn't a Honeycomb user? How much overhead is this going to add, right? Like, do I have to maintain this dependency forever, right? Like, OpenTelemetry solves a lot of this problem. The other thing has been kind of empowering people from, you know, hundreds of different organizations to contribute rather than just, you know, one company plus, you know, its customers that happen to contribute upstream, right? Like everyone is contributing to this commons. And also that means that there's been some great foundational work around, uh, around ARM compatibility in particular, where early on, you know, I basically came, came in and was like, wait a second, the open telemetry collector, which is kind of the Swiss army knife for kind of transforming telemetry data from one format to another, to sending, you know, to routing it with a YAML config file. It was being built and tested only on, only on a small handful of architectures. And I said, we should make this build on ARM64 out of the box, you know, and I set up builders for it. And, you know, being able to just reach in and do that contribution to have it accepted and then to just have that available now to the community is is pretty huge. Nice. Yeah. So um, I, I love I love talking open source. I love hearing people's views. Um, I think that I think that uh, definitely what you said resonates with me. So that's awesome. Um, you know, there is a question I'm looking here that I missed, you know, when we were talking about the Graviton stuff. And I, I really do want to touch on this because uh, your 16 plus years of experience as an SRE, I think, um, is very important to, to mention here, right? And when, uh, so, so open telemetry. Let's 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 close that box for a second. Let's reopen the previous topic here, okay? Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, with 16 plus years of experience as an SRE, what can you tell us about your particular experience working? On Graviton, and we're reopening that that yeah. So I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I think the interesting thing is that as an SRE, you're concerned about reliability, feature velocity, and cost, right? That those are kind of three of the key dimensions that you think about a lot. So we're always looking for ways to enable people to ship faster, to ship more cheaply, and still maintain the trust of our users, right? The cool thing about SRE as a comparison point to the kind of ops of your was the ops of your would get a box thrown over at them over the wall that you would be like, you know, no, you shall not make any changes to my system. You shall not pass, right? Like, whereas in SRE, we're a lot more flexible about that, right? Like, we're, we're willing to say, you know what, if we're hitting and beating our reliability targets, we're willing to take more chances and run more experiments so that we can innovate faster. So, you know, in this particular case, it was really gratifying to see that we could say, you know what, like our mission is to empower experimentation and innovation and, sh and shipping faster as long as reliability goals are met. So Graviton came along and we were able to kind of fold that in at Honeycomb because we had adopted the idea of, okay, these are our service level objectives. Uh, this is kind of the target we're aiming to hit. And as long as we don't cross that line, we can continue with doing this experiment. Nice. Very nice. Okay, cool. I'm glad we were able to, to talk about that. Now let's not reopen open telemetry. We, yeah. So let's reopen the open telemetry box now. All right. <laughs> so back, back to that. Um, how, how, how does someone get involved in this project? So, I mean, how, how can someone go contribute to open telemetry or consume it, get involved with it in general? Yeah. So I think the main thing to do with open telemetry, if you'd like to get involved, is first of all, become a user of it, right? Like add open telemetry to your project. In most cases, it's adding about five lines of code plus one uh, package management dependency um, and start using open telemetry to, um, you know, start using open, open telemetry, you know, either the collector or using the SDK in your individual uh, language to, to start routing the data to a backend like Honeycomb or, you know, uh, we have a free tier or to Jaeger or to any other backend. And if you find that there's something missing or hard to, or hard to understand, you know, feel free to act to file an issue in the open telemetry repos. Um, feel free to join our Slack. Uh, we're, because we're a CNCF project, we use the Cloud Native Computing Foundation Slack. Um, so there is, I think, slack.cncf.io is a mechanism for joining the Slack, and there is a dedicated open telemetry channel. Very um, nice. Yeah, I think we have we have an ARM uh, channel in there as well. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, excellent. I didn't know yeah. that. 
I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we do. Um, as as, uh, as platinum or gold members of of CNCF, I think we got we got something like that. I will get right on joining that. Yeah, I'll, I'll confirm it with you later. That, don't, don't quote me on it yet. Um, all right. So um, now I, I want to. I always like giving compliments where compliments are due, especially when it comes to getting started with a new product or service. And so I spent some time poking through uh, the honeycomb documentation and blogs and, you know, learning area, basically on the getting started section. And so, you know, kudos. I think that you all have a great section of, of, uh, learning materials there. Um, I was hoping maybe you could kind of just walk us through a little bit of this getting started process. So I'm a developer or I'm someone from a company exploring honeycomb as a solution where might I go to get started here? And how could you walk me through that process? Yeah, um, certainly. So I have a, I have a, uh, a set of example projects. Um, so let's go ahead and clone this, uh, the sample project. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and hit the remix button as soon as this loads. Um, and this will generate a temporary container that is running the OpenTelemetry SDK attached to a sample application. Um, so if I go and pop open the preview window, uh, you'll be able to see um, once it does its initial build, uh, you'll be able to see it offers an interface for generating a list of numbers. Um, and for those of you who are mathematically inclined, this sequence of numbers may look familiar. This turns out to be the Fibonacci series, right? Two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, and so forth. Um, so if I look at the source code, right, like it does a bunch of the boilerplate to instantiate open telemetry. Our documentation walks you through that. Um, but the kind of core fundamental code here is relatively N modified, but you can decorate it with kind of individual calls to the open telemetry API to create trace spans or to populate attributes on the, on the trace. Um, but the only thing that you need to do with regard to Honeycomb is if you go to the um, if, if you go to the team settings, right? Like you can basically say, for this team, I want to uh, you know I'm I'm going to to add an API key. Arm demo. Right, and I'm going to use the automatically generated. Uh, glitch name. So I'm just going to check that it's rebuilt. Yep. It automatically rebuilds, which I think is one of the cool things about glitch. So now if I hit go and I hit stop, what I'll see over here is I'll see that I have a little bit of data flowing, right? So I can now see in the arm demo data set that I have, you know, some data flowing and I can start looking at, you know, why is that application running so slowly? And you can start seeing, you know, the shape of what it might look like to run, to go through a distributed trace. Mm. And that's all done with code that you can see right here, right? It's understanding code that is a relatively simple, simple demo application. So that's kind of one way of getting started. Um, so my colleague, uh, Jess Jessica Kerr has, uh, I think at graceful.dev, um, where is this graceful to dev courses? Um, there we go. So this this here, uh, the introduction to observability course, is the best way of getting started with that um, because it's kind of a guided tour uh, that goes through this a little bit more slowly uh, and lets you follow along at your own pace. So that's kind of the best way to get started with uh, you know understanding. Here's open telemetry. Here's honeycomb. Here's how to navigate the honeycomb UI. And once you're comfortable with that, you can do the same thing that we did to add tracing to the demo app. And you can, in your application, import the dependencies for you know, HTTP instrumentation or gRPC instrumentation and wire it up uh, with our helpful uh, with our helpful documentation. And yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm going to just take this over for one second because I want to show people this. Yeah, so like literally at the honeycomb.io website, if I just go back here at the honeycomb.io website, you, you can go to this learn section. You can see all this, all this stuff too, right? So like docs and getting started. So all the stuff that Liz is going through, like you, you can, you can literally find all sorts of, of resources from here as well. So yeah, sorry. I just wanted to take that over and, and just kind of show people the, the drop down there, but uh, let's go back to yours. Cause I, I like this more. <laughs> 
Yeah, so what I wanted to show you over here was kind of what does it look like when you fully instrumented something, right? Like what what is the power and capability of this? So one thing I wanted to show you was the progress that we've made towards that kind of last 5% of our workload that's not yet running on ARM. So uh, we can basically see, um, I've been tracking for the past, uh, you know, several months, the relative performance, right? You can see this query was originally run four months ago. We keep original copies of all data, of all data from queries that people actually ran. So like this data has, you know, long since expired. We keep data about two months, um, but I can see the query results from a year ago, from four months ago. But let's run this today to see how are we doing. So I can see, you know, for every call to AWS Lambda, we are running an A-B test right now as we speak between running uh, a portion of Honeycomb queries on ARM and a portion of Honeycomb queries on AMB64, right? So you can see here that we are indeed, right? Like, you know, we ran uh, in that particular five minute window um, on Monday this week, uh, we ran 25 million queries on ARM64 and 62 million on AMB64. And you can see that the performance is basically largely similar. It's roughly on par, um, except for the secret is that each uh, millisecond of execution time on ARM64 is about 20 to 30% cheaper on AWS because they're, they, you know, ARM processors are more efficient and AWS is able to offer that compute time at lower expense. So eventually we would like to shift 100% of this workload over to ARM, but I have that visibility to see within the execution of every of every backend trace span, right? Like of every backend query that someone is running against us, we visualize that as a trace. Um, so if I go look at the past 10 minutes, for instance, I can go and pull up an actual execution of a trace that someone ran, um, that, that, a, that a real Honeycomb customer ran that hit our backend. This might take a little while to load because these are some of the kind of largest trace spans in all of Honeycomb, including uh, including our production environment, except that this is our dog food environment. But yeah, that's basically how we like to think about things. Um, the other cool thing that I did want to show you is, um, I want to show you. I like how you actually call it UI dash dog food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> dog oh, yeah. fooding your own stuff. I mean, like, there you go. Yeah, so I can go and I think I have annotated here a comparison of the number of vCPU, yes, uh, broke, broken down by, uh, by whether things are Graviton. Um, so you can see, see, I think here we keep the data much longer, so I'm going to run this here. So you can see here that basically, you know, as I said, like 95% of our workload, 99% of our EC2 workload, at least certainly is running on ARM, right? It's just this very, very vanishingly small percentage of, of work that is running on, on AMD64, right? So I can even group by not just uh, is Graviton 2, but let's group it by host group as well to find out which services are lagging behind, right? So I can see that our query backend running on Graviton, our sampling proxy running on Graviton, Kafka's on Graviton, our ingest work is running on Graviton. The only thing that's lagging behind are like our uh, our legacy metrics proxy, a couple of uh, a couple of static web page serving backends, right? Like it's really this tiny fraction sliver of work, but pretty much every Honeycomb query passes through entirely ARM64 at this point, except at the point that it reaches AWS Lambda, right? Aha! There we go, right? Like, so you can see here, this this here is the execution of that individual trace that took 50 seconds, and we can see the contribution of each individual Lambda invoke towards it. That is so cool. Oh, I, I wonder if the viewers realize how cool that is. <laughs> that is so cool. All right, Liz, okay. So, you know, last thing here I wanna talk about, right? You're on a stream, you're on our, uh, Innovation Coffee live stream. You also host under this whole resource topic. You also host a stream, and the stream is called Observability Office Hours. Could you tell us a little bit about this? And we have yeah. So I've got a couple topic. of things I can definitely plug. Um, so I I am a co-host of the uh, podcast called OllieCast. Um, we publish episodes every other week, um, and we also have. Uh, I do do office hours, um, which you can sign up for at honey.co slash meet slash Liz. So that's kind of an opportunity for anyone who's listening here uh, to book time one-on-one -on -one with me. 
uh, to basically answer any questions that you might have. Um, it's one of the really great things about being a developer advocate is that I get to just spend time out in the community talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. Before COVID, I would get most of those interactions talking to people at conferences, but it turns out to be way more accessible to people to be able to just book 30 minutes one-on-one -on -one where we're not saying hi and bye in a conference hallway for like five minutes. Like, but actually getting a chance to do a deep dive into your specific problem and to do so regardless of whether you're physically co-located. Like, I think that's been one of the most exciting things almost about realizing that the ways we were doing things before the pandemic weren't necessarily the right ways. Yeah, I, I, on, a, on a separate tangent here, I want to say like one of the best things that came out of the pandemic, which has recently disappeared, is the immediate streaming of movies. Like, do you remember when when like a, a brand new movie would come out and it would just immediately hit the streaming services? But now they're going back to theaters and I'm just like, gosh, give me Spider-Man so right away. I was so privileged when I was uh, living in Sydney over over the past uh, summer in Sydney, uh, outdoor movie theater uh, ah. on, the Sydney, on the Sydney Harbor. Like, oh my goodness. Like I got to see the Matrix Resurrections like in person with a bunch of uh, other fans. That's like cool. in a in a COVID safe way where, you know, everyone was wearing masks and we were all sitting outside um, and it was just amazing. That is yes, awesome. uh, that's so that this is uh, all the cast is up on screen now. That's my uh, that's the podcast they co-host. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And so um, just so you know, Jonathan uh, realizes how uh, the value of Honeycomb and he just signed up. And Jonathan, you did just <laughs> see uh, you also saw the uh, the one on one opportunity. So if you do have any questions. Uh, you know, Liz did say there's that link. We'll share that in the description. We can post it. Yeah, up it's, help, well. it's helpful for me as it's helpful for you, right? Like that's the other secret thing is that I learn so much from people who are booking meetings with me to understand where are people confused, where do people need help, what do they, what feedback do they find great about the product, right? Like that, that's all improvement that I get to bring back into the product. So this is, you know, it's a two-way street, right? Like I think that's really wonderful. Great, great. And so Liz, you know, as, as, as much as I could literally continue talking with you for another hour or even more, um, it is the top of the hour. We want to obviously respect your time, the time of our viewers. So um, this is where we go into the shameless plug. You've earned a shameless plug. What would you like to tell everyone watching now and on demand later? Yeah, there are two things I'd like to share with you. Number one, uh, as I said earlier, I am writing a book. The book is almost out. Um, you can get a free copy of the kind of raw and real uh, version of the book uh, at the link in the description. Um, so please do check out a free copy of Observability Engineering if you'd like to learn more about kind of how we think philosophically about observability and how you can apply it in practice. And the other thing I wanted to share is right now, as we're speaking, I am matching $20,000 towards a solidarity fund to people who don't currently have a strike fund or other kind of labor organizing, uh, official labor organizing force behind them. So our goal is to really help people be able to pay their bills, pay their health care while they're potentially protesting uh, what's going on at their employer, whether their employer is, you know, where the labor conditions aren't what workers would like or whether there have been layoffs or like, those are things where we think it's real. I think it's really important to support workers who are going through a tough time and organizing over it. That is, that is very, very uh, cool of you, Liz. I think that's awesome. So um, yeah, definitely head down to both of those links, get the book. And uh, if you're able to contribute, I think that's a great cause. So, you know, uh, awesome. Thank you so much. And Liz, I would like to thank you personally and on behalf of arm, uh, for attending this. I mean, gosh, it's so, so we've been trying to make you. this happen for like six months. Like I'm yeah. glad it's finally happened. It's been a while. Yeah. And so thank you so much for your time. We know it's valuable. You spent an hour with us. We really appreciate that. So thank you very much for, for doing that. And if anything else comes up around honeycomb or any cool stuff that you have going on in the future, please feel free to ping us. We'd love to have you back on the show. I have an article coming out in, I think two or three weeks uh, on the AWS blog about how AWS helped us optimize Kafka to run on Graviton 2 and on their storage awesome. instances. So yeah. Okay. Have something to share in a couple of weeks. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you once again. And uh, real quick, I'm going to close out that the, the episode right now. But you know, thank you for joining us. If you just hang around for a minute while I close this out, awesome. All right. So, um, Liz joined us. Liz F F J. Liz Fong Jones joined us from Honeycomb. The whole hour we spent talking about Honeycomb, Honeycomb on Graviton, all sorts of really cool stuff. Thank you, Liz, for joining us. Thank you, all the viewers out there for joining us. Thank you for spending this hour watching Innovation Coffee. If you enjoyed the episode, please smash that like button. It really helps us out. Subscribe to the channel, Arm Software Developers. And we look forward to seeing you next week and every Thursday at 5 p.m. UTC. We'll see you next time. Liz, thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a nice weekend.